It's by topological quantum rotor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me at uh, this uh, very nice workshop. Thank you everyone to still being here for So uh, I want to talk uh, about this work, which is a joint work with uh, Alessandro Tiani in um, uh, Julich in Germany and Barbara Terral in, uh, in Delft. Uh, and this, uh, this is uh, some work about doing error correction with some slightly exotic uh, quantum systems, uh, namely quantum rotors. And so I thought I spend a um, little time giving a little bit of motivation of why one uh, would want to look at that, because I guess it's not obvious and maybe that you, you have more interest in following the rest of the talk after that. Um, okay, so the, maybe the first consideration is that uh, when you go uh, into a lab where they try to do like quantum experiments, uh, most of the time they don't have qubits at hand. They have some complicated physical system and um, and when you want to correct for errors, uh, it can be really nice to really have in mind the precise system and be able to correct uh, errors that are relevant to the hardware that uh, there is. So, um, and one nice uh, fact about a particular platform, uh, which is a superconducting uh, circuit, is that you can uh, view uh, the degrees of freedom that are in there as quantum rotors. So that's maybe one motivation. There's a lot of work in uh, superconducting circuits. Uh, maybe there's something to, to, to look at there, but there are also various other quantum systems that can be viewed as rotors. As rotors. So this is not, uh, this is just maybe one uh, relevant application. Uh, the, the other question that I find very interesting and uh, Victor gave a, uh, a lot of good uh, insight on that is the, the question about, uh, which is more fundamental, about uh, can we protect also like um, uh, infinite dimensional systems? Can we, uh, how, how does error correction work with infinite dimensional system? And uh, if you encode infinite dimensional system, can you do something or not? I think it's a very interesting question. And uh it's uh, difficult uh, to to address and maybe rotors are like somewhat easy uh platform to to think about these questions and the last uh, kind of interest that uh, brought me to these uh, to these rotors is that uh, there's a, a lot of relation between uh, error correcting codes and uh, the homology and uh, oftentimes, if you go read some homology books, it's all over like integer coefficients. And when we do qubits, we we take mod two for everything. But there's there's some like some rich phenomenon that can happen when you keep the integers. And if you try to do this, then we see you get to quantum rotors. Okay, some context, uh, more context about this stream, like this motivation point. So about the hardware, there, there exists already some proposal of superconducting circuits uh, that are somehow intrinsically protected against, uh, against noise and they are called protected superconducting qubits. And there are a few examples. And actually during this work, we, we realized that really they could be expressed as instances of the our, uh, rotor codes. And so uh, that kind of motivates further the, this first point. And uh, so I don't think I'll talk a lot about, about this. I have some slides, but I probably won't get to them. Uh, about the second question about like doing error correction with infinite dimensional systems. So several things are, uh, already exist and were, were investigated before. So I would say there's a first class uh, of codes that were described very well by Victor which are when, so you have a s infinite dimensional systems and there are some like uh, parameters that, that, that describe the states and uh, they have a, a group structure. And sometimes you can think of doing a regression that agrees with the group structure. So you have a real number, you are measuring the real number, doing linear combinations. Uh, and all of these techniques, I would say, uh, I would call them this continuous variable correction. Uh, so when you have oscillators, for example, you can try to encode oscillators into oscillators with these nullifiers that Victor was talking about. And uh, th this was uh, done in, uh, some time ago now, and they were shown to be good against like discrete errors. So if you only put error on specific 
uh, systems, then you, you, you can correct. But then if you put some more relevant noise, like Gaussian noise on every, every system, then these, these codes are, are, are no longer uh, good. If you look at quantum rotors, there was also already some proposals for rotor versions of Tori code or hard codes. And this is really in, in the, the CV formalism. You, you also do things that agree with Z or T. Okay, I'm going to describe this later group. Okay. But then uh, I'm going to talk about encoding, uh, okay, not only, but I'm also going to talk about including discrete systems or qubits into this infinite dimensional system rotors. And so in this uh, area, there was mostly what uh, Victor already said, the um, technique about like having modular measurement. So you, you're doing, you're measuring something that kind of uh, cuts your, your space and that doesn't agree with your, your group. So there are some work about oscillators into oscillators and then also qubits into oscillators. This is like basically GKP. And also into some more exotic uh, systems like including rotors where you do these modular measurements. But now I'm going to really talk about, it's like you have a real number uh, describing your state and you're measuring like this value mod two pi or something. Uh, and this is a way to discretize your space and, and to have a, a discrete space. But here I'm really going to not do that. I'm, and this is part that was surprising when studying this is that I'm only going to do measurement that, that I agree with the group structure of the system I have. So I'm going to have a collection of quantum rotors, do this like CV type error correction on it. I'm going to be able to encode qubits and or rotors like in the logical space. Uh, okay, this is the outline, right. So let me describe a bit more precisely, uh, like mathematically, what, what are rotors. So I just have uh, uh, infinite dimensional basis, which is indexed by the integer z. So this can be like plus one, plus two, or minus three, minus four, it's all, all integer. This is my uh, basis for my space. And then when I do the quantum states, what do I do? I do superposition and they, they need to square to one. This is, uh, okay, this is expected. There's a, there's a dual representation of these states, which in terms of uh, phases, which basically goes through the uh, Fourier series. So if I, if I take all my coefficients and then sum them with some like a periodic uh, function, I'm going to take, uh, get a periodic function. And uh, this is another way of parameterizing the, the states and uh, when I when I write uh, this function like this, it really looks like a, a bracket where I would have my state and I have some kind of state uh, parameterized by a phase here, which I'm going to consider as a correct state, but it's not it's not normalizable. But it, okay, it's not a, a VT. So I have these phase states which are conjugated to the to the number of states the. The L's. And so the phase are parameterized by this, uh, yeah, uh, what I call T, which is just R divided by two pi Z. So just a number between zero and two pi, uh, it's a circle. Okay, so uh, I'm going to define generalized polys on this state and they're going to nicely allow me to define like simple stabilizer state as uh, codes. So I have the X, the X basically is this uh, momentum kicks that uh, Victor was talking about. So you, if you do X with parameter uh, integer M, then you're just doing L plus M. And if you look at this action in this conjugate basis, you're just adding a phase actually. And then there's the, the, the other uh, generalized poly, the Z, which is just on the number of states, it just add a phase. And if you look at the action on the, this, uh, Phase states, you, you're also just adding or subtracting this phase. Um, so everything works very much like uh, usual polys, except that now I have my x are like in, uh, integer and not uh, f2, and my z are a phase, not, not f2. And uh, they compose like nicely just with the, the addition of the, uh, of the group, and then they commute. Uh, the, the way you expect, you just have to, you pick up a phase multiplying this, uh, these two numbers. Okay, and now I'm going to uh, consider n rotors and I'm just 
taking the, the N rotor pulleys and we just uh, like uh, at the J's rotor, I do an X or a Z. And then I record all this in just a, a big vector of either integers for the X or a big vector of either phases for the Z. And this works uh, everything like the same as uh, this uh, symplectic uh, representation for polys. You have, when you try to commute them, you just have to pick up the phase of the inner product between these two vectors of integers for the ends and phase for the phases. Okay, so now I have everything I need to define the codes. And I'm going to basically pick the, the CSS definition and it's going to work out. So I need two uh, integer matrices. Uh, so the, the number of colons in the, is the number of rotors and the number of rows is going to be the number of independent uh, X or Z stabilizers. And I pick them such that I can multiply them to zero. And so this is like an integer multiplication. So there are some minus signs in there so that when you everything goes to zero exactly. There's no like mod something. Okay, and these matrices basically they they are what define the, the stabilizers of uh, of my future code that I'm going to define, and I can generate all of them by uh, just have uh, multiplying on the left by row vectors. So I have this is just basically doing linear combination of uh, of rows of HX gives me an X uh, stabilizer, uh, linear combination of rows of HZ, uh, with this time I can multiply by any phase, give me a Z stabilizer. And I'm going to form the stabilizer group by multiplying all of these together and, uh, and define the code just as a plus one eigenspace of all of this big group. So for this to work, we know they need to commute, so we can just check quickly that it works. If you compute uh, the commutation between any stabilizers, you see that the phase basically is just the, the product of these matrices that you pick up, and this is by definition we chose such that this is zero, so we just chose such that it's a valid uh, stabilizer code. Let's do an example to be a bit more concrete. So let me pick these two matrices, so I have four rotors, uh, I have this three X stabilizer like this, like uh, on the first two one, the last two, and then uh, some common one, and then a common one for the Z's, okay? And this just mean, okay, I'm just going to write down this in terms of poly operators. If I act, uh, I move by M the first and by minus M the second, then this should stabilize my state and all of this for, for the other. Okay, so let's uh, write down code states to understand what they look like now. Um, all right, so let, let's see what, what does this Z constraint uh, impose on my, on my code. So let's write down a state that we were, would want to be in the code. It's stabilized by any of this uh, SZ. And so if I compute this, it's just I, I see that I pick up a phase there, which is... Uh, where the, this matrix XG is multiplied by the, the number here, the, 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 the number vector. And because this, this is true for every phi, I can scale all my stabilizer with uh, any phase I want. Uh, then uh, you see that basically it picks up only, only the number, uh, the vector of numbers that are in the kernel of this HZ. And if I looked at the X constraint, I'm going to see that the coefficient uh, of this uh, number state, they, they need to be the same if they are equal up to uh, something in the image of the HX. So this is very familiar for the, uh, for the that I've seen this like homology relation. Uh, so the basically we can write codes, code states in terms of the uh, some of our cosets of the kernel of HZ in quotient by the image of HX. Okay, so let's let's spell out this homology picture to to understand what's happening. Um, so in homology, you have chain complexes, which you have just some like groups here that are and uh, maps uh, between them, such that uh, if you take the map twice, then you you get zero. 
And what this is, this is basically the, the space of uh, uh, the, the space of stabilizer here. I generate my stabilizer with uh, some Rx vector of integers. And then using hx, I can I generate the stabilizers. And for any operator here, uh, I can compute the syndrome with hz, uh, which lives in this space. And uh, so because the like the matrices have the stabilizer have to commute, this is the same condition as this being a chain complex. So when I multiply this matrices, I have zero. And then the computing the homology of the chain complex is basically computing what we did before the the uh, the logical operators. And now the funny thing that happens when you are working with rotors and where all of this is Z and not F2 or some like finite uh, field um, is that you, you can get uh, different things in the, in the homology group. So this, this H1 here is the, what's left when you, you, you look at the kernel uh, quotiented by the image of this. Uh, these things are always split into two parts. There's one part which uh, is called the free part, which is uh, some copies of uh, of, uh, of Z. So this is uh, this is like again a rotor. So I have a, like state index by by Z. But that I also have something which is called the torsion part, which is uh, actually uh, some uh, cyclic cyclic group. And so this means that uh, if I choose well my chain complex, I'm going to have in my logical space, I'm going to have some like uh, some discrete, uh, some finite uh, things. Okay, and then uh, right, then I can generate all these logical operators just using. I can have some matrix that records uh, that that implements this like. At this group in the in the space of, of operators. So uh, this is the same way as usual. You can add any stabilizer, and then you have some logical component that move you between cosets, and uh, this is your logical x operator. Okay, let's let's see uh, how this torsion can come about on this small uh, example. So we are looking for things that are uh, in the kernel of uh, H Z. So uh, uh, what this is, I just need some, some vector that sums to, to zero. So I'm going to put, uh, for instance, a minus one and a plus one in my vector. This, this would uh, be in the kernel of this. But then I also need that to not be in the image of uh, hx, and you can check that this is not in, OK? But uh, you can also check that if you sum all the rows here, you're going to end up with something with like, minus two plus two. So I cannot generate minus one plus one, this vector, yeah? but I can generate twice. Uh, I can generate it with a coefficient two in front. And so what that means, that means that this operator, this like shifting by minus one, the second and plus one, the, the term, this is uh, something that moves me uh, between cosets. So this is a logical operator, but if I do it twice, basically, I, I did the stabilizer, so I'm back to the, the I, I, did, I didn't move. So actually, this is how the, I, I transform this uh, rotor into a qubit, because now uh, this operator is uh, equivalent to, uh, to a z2. Its orbit is 2 uh, when you mode out the stabilizer. So and in general, that's how distortion comes about. It's like when you have. Uh, you can generate some some vector with the hx matrix such that uh, it appears in the image with some coefficient in front, but there's no way to make it without the coefficient. And if you have this, this means that this um, the the order of this w is d in the space where you mod out the stabilizers. So having such a such a vector w. Uh, which is sometimes called a weak boundary, means that uh, you have a, a, a ZD in your logical space. Actually, 
Okay, so now we've described the uh, like kind of the easy part, the X operators. So you have only integers, everything is nice. Uh, I want also to describe the, the conjugate uh, operator, so the, the phases. And for this, with like with qubits, we are used, we just, you just look at the matrices uh, the other way and you just transpose and everything and everything was the same. Here it's almost uh, as easy, so you have to kind of take the dual of the, uh, the chain complex. You just have to be a bit careful about how you take the dual. So uh, taking the dual, uh, the, like the formal thing is you, you look at the, um, instead of looking at the, the, the initial space, you look at the homomorphism from the space to some group. And here in this group, you, you need to choose uh, the phases. And if you do this, you're going to transform Z into T and T into Z. So that's the correct notion of homology basically for this. And, but, and then the, the, the dual of the maps is pretty easy, it's still the transpose. But now it's the transpose between, so these matrices are integer matrices, but now we are mapping phases to phases. So it's not exactly uh, like linear algebra here. But, uh, and then you also invert the role of like stabilizer and syndrome, but this is, yeah. And then uh, because we did the dualization with respect to the, the phase group, actually we are guaranteed, so this is like a theorem to, to have a well-formed uh, like um, uh, cohomology. Uh, co so the cohomology is exactly the dual of the homology. So we, have, we do have a like well-defined uh, logical space. And it will have the same structure. You will have like the free part will be a bunch of uh, copies of T's. And then the, uh, the, the torsion part will be also um, same uh, same group, the ZDs, but now uh, with phases, so discretize the, the phase. Okay, and you can form the, the the operators the same way. So let's let's see how that works for this. Um, so so we need something that's in in the kernel of uh, HX, but now you see this. In principle, when you look at this, you see it's not possible. This, this thing is full rank, right? So I, there's nothing in the kernel. But now, if, uh, let's say, I put, uh, I only select the first two uh, rotors and I, I put uh, a pi shift, now uh, because uh, pi and minus pi is the same thing, uh, now I'm going to be in the kernel of HX when I view it as a map from phases to phases. Like, it's not true for a map from real to reals, but uh, for phases it works. And so we basically figure out that this, this code uh, is only uh, one logical qubit uh, with this operator. So you, you act with minus one plus one in there. And then with the pi shift, you are on the first two policies. OK. Uh, maybe I should stop for questions. Great. Uh, now, okay, I, I defined some codes. I can write down some like logical operators. I can see what's in the logical space. Uh, that's nice. Now I want to, somehow I want to characterize, do these codes correct for something. Um, of course, I expect that maybe in terms of this like generalized poly, I can, I can say some things, uh, but I need to define uh, some kind of distance and it becomes tricky. Like for qubits, you have either zero or one and then you change it or not. And uh, this is fairly easy. So the, like doing something or just the humming weight is going to record where, where things happen. Here I can have a, like, I can shift by one or by two, by three. Is it the same thing? I need to decide uh, what I do. So uh, one like, not unreasonable things to do to say, I'm going to have some kind of polynoise and I'm going to say the probability of uh, like shifting, for instance, uh, like uh, momentum kicks is maybe it's, it's uh, smaller if the shift is uh, higher and same thing for shifting the phase. If I shift a lot, it's not very probable, but shifting a little should be probable. So I should have some kind of like uh, function of the how much I, uh, I I move, so one kind of choice, but you could you could make uh, many different. This is not very like physically motivated. It's just let's say that kicking the momentum by one is probability p, and so uh, uh, and so then I have this kind of uh, uh, 
uh, equation for the probability of momentum shift. And then uh, let's say that uh, I put a Gaussian in a, in a phase shift, but then writing a Gaussian on a circle is annoying with the sum, so I just put a sinus instead. This is like some approximation. Uh, when I do this, I okay, I, I see that in this like expression for the for the probability of uh, of error, basically I, I put an exponential of some potential. And I'm just going to define the weight of my errors as this, like the this potential. So the sum of uh, of uh, of this uh, this this weight function on all the, the rotors. So I have the one the one norm for the integer shift, and then just the sum of okay sine square uh, of the half angles for the for the phases. This is just one choice. Now I can define distances for my code. So what I want to do, I say, okay, the x distance is basically the minimum weight uh, shift uh, that, that belongs to the logical operator. So this is pretty straightforward. This looks very much the same as uh, what we're used to. So I minimize over all the stabilizer and all the logicals. Now uh, for, the, for the phase shift, it's a bit tricky because now you can, um, Basically, if, if you encode a rotor, this means that there are some logical phase shifts that are very, very small, right? And you can make them as small as you want. So you kind of, but you, so if, if you were to just to minimize over all the logical operators, then you would always get zero when you have rotor in the logical space. So one thing that you can do is just say, okay, you're going to compare how much that costs you to move in the logical uh, a space compared to how much that would cost you to move in the bare uh, bare space. So you just divide by uh, the cost when there's no encoding. Uh, so this is nice. And if uh, if the logical space is um, is discrete, you have only logical qubits, then this is just going to be a constant. So the, the definition of distance will be like equivalent to the one we used to. Okay. Now. Uh, we can prove some uh, a few things about these distances. So the first one is for the x distance is pretty easy. It's basically if you have a code that actually you knew how how it worked on qubit or qubits, uh, basically you you can only get a better distance when you go to the to the full uh, uh, integer space, uh, which is uh, nice. So uh, there's a slightly more precise statement here. And now for the phase operators, everything is more annoying because, um, because so we have a definition of a logical operators, which is uh, pretty nice, but then we have uh, these stabilizers that are continuous. So we can add them with uh, continuous um, uh, shift. And so now there's this kind of phenomenon where you can spread out your uh, logical operators and depending on your choice of weight function, it might be uh, useful, at least in minimizing the cost, to have smaller shifts, but everywhere. Right? So in Hamming distance, that uh, doesn't make sense. Like you, you want to have a small system that has changed as possible. But in like when you have uh, some uh, continuous weight, then sometimes you can do things like. That. So for instance, the example we had, it was like shift by pi the two first one. But if you add uh, pi over two times this the stabilizer, then you will get pi over two everywhere. So okay, in this case, that doesn't change the weight that I chose, but you could have this on a larger scale where it's it's uh, beneficial to spread out the, the logic. So now, we, so you're in trouble to have some kind of bonds on the distance, but you can still do something, which is, I think, not uh, ideal, but it's at least uh, something which is uh, using the notion of uh, disjointness of the code helps you bound the distance. So you're going to choose a, a set of X logical operators that are disjoint. So you want them um, as big as possible and as many as possible different, no, as small as possible, sorry, and as many as possible different. And, uh, you, and they are disjoint, so you, basically they're going to force the Z logical operator uh, to uh, to uh, to have uh, a lot of weight, and if you have so okay, so if you have a set where you have n of these uh, different operators and they are they have a max weight of of d, 
then you can you see that uh, you can spread at most like you can spread your logical operator but at most uh, by this factor so okay so basically you you have n times uh, d times the 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 phase spread out over all the the the, 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 the rotors in one uh, logical operator okay so now I can define a notation for, because I have a, a distance notion, I can define a notation. It's basically uh, what you would expect. So you have number of rotors, and then you, have, you have need to describe the logical space. So you have like some logical rotors and then a bunch of QDs, and you have to record which uh, dimensions. And then the, the distance, which is the regular X distance, and then this like relative uh, phase distance. Uh, so now I want to discuss a bit how to get some of these codes and can we get some, uh, some parameters. So the like more natural thing is to try to pick examples from uh, cellular homology. So basically when you have a surface and with a tessellation on it, you can always write a chain complex, which is uh, face to edges to vertices. And uh, for instance, if you pick the projective plane, uh, I have a few examples here. Maybe here you can rec recognize the example we've seen so far with like four edges. So, uh, okay, maybe I should say, so the way you should read this uh, drawing is that when you reach uh, the, the border of this circle, then you're teleported on the, uh, on the opposite side. So, so that's why the, there's not orientation here because if you start this way, then you, you are done there and so this, you, Turn the other direction. And then you do the usual uh, homological thing. It's you put rotors on edges, and then you put, okay, this, this is different. You put uh, Z stabilizer on the vertices and X stabilizer on the faces. Um, actually, this is a bit funny, but you have to do that. You cannot do the other way around. Uh, like with qubits, it's the same choosing faces or vertices for your, for your checks, but here, like just transposing everything, uh, you're not allowed to do it without also going from phases to numbers. So, uh, so okay, let's look at the, the the homology groups of the projective plane to understand what's happening. So, um, right. So you have a, if you are okay with z coefficient. Uh, and the homology is Z2, and then you go to T coefficient, the homology is Z2, so that's like your the logical qubit we've seen. Uh, as I was saying, if you go the other way around, you say, oh, I'm going to put my uh, axes on uh, on vertices and, and uh, Zs on faces, then, then you get some trivial homology, so you don't, don't want to do that. And then if you try to do like the qubit version, then you have a qubit, and if you do other, uh, coefficient, then you you won't get anything. Like so, really, yeah, the projective plane is like, uh, yeah. Do you have like a physical explanation for that? A physical explanation for for what? For the. <laughs> we don't know homology. Um, uh, yes, I do. So the the thing is that when you try to. So okay, edges are. Uh, the incidence between vertices and edges is fundamentally different from the incidence between faces and edges. Because when you have, uh, right, an edge is going from one vertex to the other, and the incidence is, has to be plus one on one vertex and minus one on the next uh, vertex. And this, you cannot, like, you cannot take the, the dual, dual faces there and have the same thing. This, like, this is really specific to vertex to edge incidence. It's like it's constrained. Otherwise, it's not a vertex and an edge. Why is it the Z2 in like the specific fields, the rings, but not fields? Like, why can you get to put qubit there, but you can't in this other? Okay. Um, so we could look at look at this. So if you if you try to make a, a like a homology cycle in there, you need to, uh, uh, so this face is positively incident with this vertex. So, okay, we, we put some number there. And then if we go up there, it's also positively incident to this one. So you have to put a, 
minus the number you put there, you have to put here. And then, but here, they, uh, they are, um, here this is uh, minus and plus. So here they say they, they need to be the same sign, but this phase says they need to be opposite signs. So only there's only pi that works there. But if, if you were with integers, there's no way of having uh, the same sign and opposite sign with integers. So there's nothing, there's nothing there if you switch X and Z. It's just if you have phases for this blue thing that you can achieve that. Maybe frustration would be the way of this is to try to describe it. In the frustration. Frustration, yeah. Like uh, you have these local constraints uh, that are fixing things everywhere, but uh, you can't globally satisfy everything that you want if you also want to have uh, certain homology properties. So I, I think a physicist would describe it in terms of frustration. Okay. So now uh, we so we saw we saw the projective plane when we can make a Mobius strip. So I'm going to make a very very thin one. So there's a basically a bunch of faces that are next to one another, and then I have a what people would call a rough boundary here. Although I have x and z inverted, so maybe it's a smooth boundary. But so I have two n rotors here, this like double uh, rotors per colon. And I have a bunch of faces. And then I, I put a twist at the end. So here I, I start. So instead of wrapping around with the same orientation, I start my orientation there. But then I, I come back uh, from the other side. Maybe I didn't draw this right. Sorry. Uh, if you compute the. Yeah, the, the, the parameter of this, you have two n rotors, and then you have one qubit there also. Uh, so the, the same thing happens if you try to like make a, a loop, then only the pi uh, is going to work out because you need them to be same sign and opposite sign at the same time. And then the x distance is two, it's just going across the, the, the strip, and then the, the, the other distance is n. Okay, now I can make a larger one. Uh, larger mobile strip, so I just add more, yeah, uh, finer lattice with this. Um, but uh, everything works out uh, pretty similar, and then you can compute uh, the parameter of this. So basically, here the disjoint set that you need to bound the z distance is basically all the parallel green lines here is enough to kind of bound the distance, but you see that. If uh, if the, the the strip is too wide, then you're going to to have a very small uh, z distance. So you need basically the strip to be much thinner than uh, than it is long. And if you pick basically like uh, the square for the uh, for the length compared to the width, then you get uh, you get some growing distance for both. Enough. It just the difference between encoding a rotor and, um, and, a, and a qubit here is just not doing the twist at the end, and then you would have exactly the same parameters but with a, a rotor. Uh, okay. You can go to 3D and uh, and do an equivalent of a 3D projective space. I just wanted to show this because I can have the same parameter, but now I don't have to have this Q. Um, Kind of shape. I don't have to have it much longer than wider. This is this is just l by l by a, n by n by n. Sorry, and uh, and I get the same type of parameters. Okay, and uh, so I, I'll go quickly through this. You can, you can also apply all your favorite construction, including uh, hypergraph products. Uh, and I, I just want to, to say this because this is the best parameter I know of with these codes I, we can, I can get so far, but probably fancier products can do much better. Okay. But the, so the hyper product, you can also express it as a product of chain complexes. And uh, when you do this, you start from two lengths, two chain complex. This is basically like a classical code, but now it's over the integers. And uh, you take the product. This gives you this length three chain complex, which your x, x, and x z matrices. You can write what they are. And the the funny part is that so there's to know what's in the logical space. There's this uh, Kuhn's theorem, 
that uh, I think people looking at hypergraph logic now know very well. But except that when I okay was looking at that, I learned that there's a there's a third term in there, so that's uh, interesting. So that the usual like uh, uh, logical of one code times something that is uh, like not zero, and then logical of the other codes. This is the normal thing. But then you also have this tor product of just the basically the torsion of the these two initial codes. So there's like an additional way of getting a logical uh, uh, activity there. If you do uh, something simple with like you pick basically classical LDPC code, you look at them uh, um, over Z instead of over Z2, uh, you can you can like have uh, a good rate of encoding of logical rotors. Now, if you want to guarantee that the Z distance is good, I don't know anything else than taking one of the codes to be a repetition code. And so now the parameters are a bit degraded, but you can have like third root of N uh, distance and third root of N uh, number of uh, rotors, so which is uh, not bad, but not great. Um, okay, so that's if you have, uh, you want to encode rotors, if you want to encode uh, QDIT, you can do also something where now uh, one of the codes, you don't take a normal uh, LABC code, but you take something with torsion. So I can uh, explain that uh, how that works. And then uh, similar thing, if you want to guarantee uh, Z distance, then there's a trick with uh, like a sign twisted repetition code and you get basically the same parameters. So third root of N qubit and then third root of N distance, you can do. Okay, and then you, there's this other funny way of getting QDIT, which is through the torsion of this thing. I don't know if it's useful, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to skip to the conclusion. I'm not going to talk about the physical realization. All right, so uh, we define uh, homological quantum rotor codes. Uh, they allow to encode logical qubits and QDITs without uh, modular constraints, or maybe this is a bit cheating to say that because there's like embedded modular uh, modularity in the phase. Uh, uh, defining X distance is pretty straightforward, but the Z distance is more tricky because you can spread out the logical operator everywhere. And uh, we know how to construct codes with uh, uh, third root of N distance and uh, same uh, uh, number of logical qubits, so that's interesting. And uh, so I didn't show it, but we show that the existing protected superconducting qubits kind of fall into the, this category. So that's that's interesting. So for future work, uh, I would like to have a systematic way of writing down protected superconducting qubits from rotor codes. Um, I think there's some really intriguing thing to explore in 3D uh, because this is the first dimension where I don't have to skew the dimension to have some growing distance for both X and Z. Um, now there might be something, so I was like, kind of listening to Victor talks about uh, if you convert these codes to number phase codes and then you regularize to cat codes, maybe you can kind of explore these cat codes in this way. Um, and also in integer homology, there's a lot of very intriguing example with what's called uh, as systolic freedom, where the the product of the like um, uh, non-trivial cycle uh, multiply to more than the volume. So maybe there's some some things to to play around here and see and find uh, nice codes. And of course now the question of like how would you actually do these things? And uh, uh, this is uh, why. Um, have you had any thoughts about how one might decode these codes? Mm. Um, uh, yes. So we extract the fact that they're homological in some sense to get some insights into decoding. So I think you quickly get into the same problem as uh, when decoding like your story code is already a bit difficult. Right. So you quickly into very similar uh, problems. Uh, so we've started to also to do actually the, like the statistical physics mapping to get a sense of what's happening. And so interestingly, so if you're in, for instance, in 2D uh, and you do the, like the rotatory code and you do the mapping for the phases, you're going to get an um, XY model with uh, actually like some quench randomness, but so something which has, we know has a transition, but which is not standard. 
And the, and the other direction, you get something that's called a solid on solid model, and that, but that's also dual to the XY model. So, but so the transition there is, uh, there's something, but maybe not enough to like. Uh, this just gives you, this doesn't necessarily give you a default. No, that, no, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it gives you maybe some. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if you go to 3D, uh, the, like the, the XY model in 3D has a, like actual uh, regular like phase on region. So that's why also I'm interested in like 3D. Maybe this works better in 3D. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess since you have more degrees of freedom, could you comment on like if you were to try to do a computation, assuming that you have whatever gate set you mm -hmm. choose to add, like are there any advantages there? So this I don't know. Um, the, all the things I've tried. So so first you are a bit constrained, and you you should uh, read Victor's paper about that about the, like the Clifford for the rotors. They are not straightforward. Like basically you are not allowed Hadamard. But, uh, there's some things there. But then when you are in logical qubit, one might expect that you find ways to do, to do everything. Uh, if you try to kind of get some non-standard phases to the qubit, I don't know yet how to do that, but uh, that would be interesting. Especially because you can encode uh, both like logical rotors and logical qubit, and then you can also do operation to untangle them. So maybe there's something there. But so far, I only found like boring Clifford things to do. But... Yeah. So I want to know your motivation for only stopping at forty. Like if you don't want to do more than coding. Uh, I, no, I'm I'm open to do any dimension. It's just that I think 3D there's already there's going to be something interesting already, May, and which might be significantly different from 2D. So that's why I'm like maybe first understand this dimension transition, but then I mean I'm also yeah. I'm happy with any dimension. All right, but that. Uh, uh, let's thank Chris up again. Thank you for the like, uh, talks, uh, speakers, uh, please be